Fellow Pelicans and friends of the UWI, welcome to Pelican Talks, where we promote interactive and positive discussions about a variety of topics and engage our alumni across the Caribbean and the world. It's my pleasure today to have as our special guest on Pelican Talks, Dr. Robin Roberts, OBE. Welcome, Dr. Roberts. Hi, welcome. It's great to be here. We are very happy to have you. So let me tell our listeners a bit about you. Dr. Robin Roberts is a very proud Pelican, having received his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery from the UWI Mona in 1980. He is highly qualified, holding a Bachelor of Science degree, honors, with a major in biochemistry from Dalhousie University in Canada, where he attained his fellowship from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, having completed his postgraduate training in uro urological surgery. He also attained his fellowship in clinical renal transplantation at Dalhousie University. Additionally, he holds a master's degree in business administration, specializing in healthcare management and health policy from the University of Miami. He is currently consultant urologist at the Princess Margaret Hospital in Nassau, the Bahamas, and has been serving there from 1987, a stellar record indeed. And he's also an academic with prostate cancer in the Bahamas being the central topic on his research agenda. Dr. Roberts, your career has been fascinating. Let's begin with your Caribbean roots heritage, however. So let's start with your parents. Where were they from? Where were you born, et cetera? Fill us in a little bit. Well, I would like to believe I am a typical Caribbean person. I come from a humble family. My mother was a waitress. My father was a civil servant. I come from a one parent, fa one parent family in terms of my mother having to raise five children. I was fortunate, if one would use that word, uh, to be the first in my family. I'm the baby. So I'm the first in my family to have gone to high school and completed, to have gone to university and completed, to have been the first one to go into medical school and to become a doctor and return home and specialize. So, that's, uh, so I can say that, um, yes, I, I think there are many of us in the Caribbean who can share that same story. That's very true, very true. And now to UWI, tell us a bit about your Mona experience. What well, I'll tell you, impact? my Mona experience was extremely special to me because when I graduated from high school, I actually got a scholarship to go to Canada. And I was a, I was a Canadian, uh, Caribbean, a Canadian Commonwealth scholar. And when I completed, I decided that uh, I did a degree in biochemistry and I decided, you know, what am I gonna do with this? So I decided to do medicine. And primarily because of cost, I actually applied to UW. I just couldn't afford to go to school in North America. And I can tell you that it changed my life going to UWI. It changed my whole perception of uh, the Caribbean. And the thing that struck me the most about UWI was coming from a school which would at that time be a modern university with all the amenities. You know, I remember going to UWI, going to UWI and I was in Irvin Hall and having to wash my clothes and having no washer and dryer. I say, oh my God, what is this that I have come to? And, but I can tell you, it was the beauty of the people. And I want to say that I, I was so pleased, excited to see, I want to call it the wealth of knowledge and the teaching that I got in UWI. And the commitment of my teachers uh, coming to school, whereby if I'm late, they want to know why I'm late, where I was, making sure I've done it right. I, you know, I learned at the feet of the masters. I, I was a student of Professor Sir George Aline, um, Prof. Rich, uh, uh, Rolf Richards. I was a student of, of uh, the famous E.V. Ellington. Um, so, you know, all, all, the, all the, the real great uh, teachers at UWI, I... You know, they taught me and having gone through the experience, I realized that this was my home. 
Mm-hmm. And then I had, and then at, after uh, my third year, I decided, let me get this real Caribbean experience. I went to Barbados for my last two years. And Barbados was very similar to Bahamas in a lot of ways. But then here I was, we were about 20 students in our class. So we had another class. So there were two of us. We had 80 students for a hospital of 600 patients. We were special. I mean, uh, they took care of us. They wanted to know everything. And I mean, so when I was finished, how could I not be a Caribbean man? (laughs) How could I not feel this is the place for me? Exactly. You know? Yes. And, and um, so when I came back home to do internship, the first vision I wanted was we've got to have this two year program just like Barbados and Trinidad. You know, we, we, we can't have a full medical school, but that two year program is just what we need for our for, for our institution to become an academic institution, to improve the quality of care for our people to start a research program so we can intervene and make things better. And uh, so I, and then I was looking towards going back to UWI to do my uh, postgraduate training. And they were just, I thought that urology was where we should go because we didn't have a urologist at all. And in fact, in UWI as a student, we did not have any formal urologists. We had the general surgeons that did urology. So I was very excited to, to get into urology. And uh, Professor Lawson Douglas was just about to start a diploma program. And just before I was about to go, I would have probably been in the first class there. I got an acceptance to go to Canada to do urology. And so I went back to my alma mater and I did a, a four year residency program. And then I decided, you know, we really need to start transplant. So I did a fellowship in transplant. At that time, Dalhousie was the, it had the biggest transplant setup in Canada. We were doing, and this was 1987, we were doing about 100 kidney transplants per year because we catered for four provinces in Eastern Caribbean. So I came home in 1987, all filled with knowledge. Listen, I just wanted to build. And uh, to tell you, there was no hesitation. I finished my program on the 30th of June and on the 1st of July, I was in Nassau. (laughs) That's fabulous. You know, yeah, there was no hesitation. You know, I needed to come home to bed. I was the first urologist in the government services. I was the first and and then I was looking at starting this transplant program. We had dialysis already. So I was excited. Yes, I can um, imagine, I can imagine. (laughs) <laughs> I have a question from a graduate in Antigua who's asking whether you lectured at, as well and where you lectured. Well, um, right now, since I've been home and getting into academia, you know, it's very interesting. A lot of folks, they don't realize, but one of the things I saw right away was I, I said, listen, we, we've got to get, I was looking, how do I get to get this two-year program in Nassau as we did in Barbados? But there were so many other things. We didn't even have a library in our hospital. We didn't even have a lecture room in our hospital. Mm. And so I thought, well, of course, the closest place was Miami. So I went to Miami and I said, listen, how can you assist us in building a library in the Bahamas? And so we got a line to them, which we stayed for almost uh, over 20 years. And we uh, had an international library linked in by a, a fax machine and then the internet. And then uh, I was instrumental in starting our first uh, office of ed- office of continuing medical education, which formed the basis of the, our medical school when we joined with UWI. And once we did that, and we looked at forming uh, a formal structured continuing education programs in all the departments, uh, they were to have grand round lectures. Uh, we were to have up to date lectures. And we did this on a weekly and on a monthly basis. We employed someone to be the administrator to make sure that we had the communication for people to be informed and to alert them to come to all the sessions that we were having. And so by 92, 93, we were rolling. Let me me just go back a little bit to the the medical library because I think that's a, a very important innovation. It was with the Princess Margaret Hospital and the University Medical University of Miami. Uh, 
medical library, right? I'll, yeah, I'll tell you a little story about that. I, mm -hmm. I, we had a little reading room and they had some journals in there about six years old, I thought. And I said, this can't happen. And I just hopped the plane and I went there and I said, I went in their medical library and I said, who is in charge? A lady by the name is Bowers. And I said, listen, I'm from the Bahamas and how can you help me? And she says, well, we have a lot of little hospitals like you. And I need to come over and have a consult to see what you have and how we can assist you. And I said, well, how much will that cost us? And she laughed and she said, will you, play a plane for the, will you pay the plane fare? And the plane fare at that time was $100. I said, yes. So she came, she came over the next week and she said, well, I'll tell you what, the, we don't, um, uh, we have a lot of hospitals like you, but you're a big hospital. You have 470 beds and we can supply you with um, all the journals you need. You can have, you can reference us via the fax machine at that time. And we will do all your literature searches. You can come over, you can borrow our books and everything and so forth. But for your size hospital, it'll, charge, it'll cost you $4,700 a year. Mm -hmm. So I got the five departments at that time, every department at that time, we all put in $500 each. And that's how we started. The Medical Association bought us a fax machine at that time. A fax machine in 19, 1991 cost $2,000. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Medical Association bought us a fax machine and we were up and running. That's amazing. And <laughs> so the, the, the physicians at the hospital really became full-time members of the medical library and had full That's access right. to all the mod modern medical literature. That's right. And in subsequent years, you basically um, secured a full virtual reality state-of-the-art library. That's right. For everyone. That's so, right. One could say that the Bahamas is kind of light years ahead of the rest of the Caribbean. I'll tell you, that was way ahead of time. And then what was interesting, once we had formed our CME office, and I'm going to come back to answer the young chap, mm -hmm. we actually had, we had applied to University of West Indies. We said, listen, we want to set up a two-year program now. Mm. And they didn't respond to us, we thought, in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually had a team that came from uh, Montserrat the American University of the Caribbean that came and asked if we could set up a clinical teaching program for their offshore medical school. Oh, wow. And he said, yes. <laughs> and that's how we started. We had the first class uh, from the AUC and there were about 50 students and we dispersed them throughout the various departments with their curriculum. And then they were well, how we how we lost them because they had committed to give us a million dollars to build a library and a lecture. Oh. And then after the first uh, three months, they reneged and said they didn't have that money. So we said, well, we can't continue with you. And the way God had it, three months later the volcano came. Ah. And then they were trying to get back at us, but at that time. We said, no, we couldn't trust you anymore. Mm -hmm. And then Trinidad had just started. And Trinidad was expanding to have a program, a twinning program with Manapal University in India. And they wanted to have a clinical post, additional clinical post for these new students that were coming into the UWI program, where they were doing the first two years in India and then transferring to the University of the West Indies for the next two years. And this is around 1994, 95, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah 90, around 95, 96. Mm -hmm. And so we said, yes, this is ideal. And so Trinidad came and they looked at our hospital. They saw our, our Office of Medical Education. They saw our relationship with the University of Miami. And they said, listen, we approve you and we're good to go. And the uh, deans came from the other school and so by 1997, we established our two-year program in the Bahamas. And um, yes. And so, so is it that um, once you establish the two-year program, yes, the Princess Margaret Hospital was accredited for teaching medical students, right? right. And mm -hmm. so you really pioneered the establishment. Um, and I understand as well being the first family practice program. 
And then after after we were in place for about uh, three four years, one of our one of our family one of our UWI graduates who did a family medicine in the United States, she returned home, and and she said, "Listen, we need family medicine physicians." So she uh, um, she sought her consultation with the folks down in in the uh, UWI, and along with some. Uh, some colleagues that she had in the United States. And so we established the uh, UWI-based uh, family medicine program in Nassau, I think around 2002. That's right. And we, yeah. Yes. And I'm we sorry. then, yeah. Go ahead. We have probably moved to be one of the biggest family medicine programs now in UWI faculty of medicine. Excellent. And I understand under your leadership, the Royal College of um, physicians of Glasgow, Scotland, accredited the Department of Surgery and began the, the surgical program in, at the Princess Margaret Hospital starting in 20, 2004. And that department was accredited um, for the UWI postgraduate program in general surgery. So you yeah, had yeah. an amazing influence. Yeah. Well, what happened was uh, after we started the, the medical school and the bachelor medicine, uh, the bachelor medicine, bachelor surgery program, we realized that the next step was to start some surgery programs. What was it? What, what, did, we, what did we need to do? Mm -hmm. And so I knew that we didn't have the resources, particularly the physician resources, to have that program as yet. And I, we had some ties with uh, England and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, one of our senior surgeons who graduated from there. He said, I know some, some people there. I know the president of Royal College. Do you think that, I think that they might be interested. And so I contacted them and they said, listen, yes, we'd be happy to at least give you a boost. We'll come down and we'll bring a team and we'll do uh, some, basic, uh, some basic studies and workshops. And we can have them eligible to do the part one of the Royal College exams in, in, uh, in England. And so they came down, and so we enrolled our students there. And I said, you know, I think that um, let me contact Trinidad. And they said, listen, we'd be happy to get you started with your DM surgery program there in the Bahamas. And so by about 2004, so we were ready to enroll our first students in the DM surgery program. And That's over the years, yeah, we have, we have uh, slowly um, increased our numbers, so we added and internal medicine, and then uh, pediatrics, and then an obstetrics and gynae, and then a psychiatry, and now an emergency medicine. So we now have seven postgraduate programs as well. Wow, you really have pioneered the advance of, of medical education in the Caribbean. Quite yeah. amazing. I had some great teachers because um, along the way, the first, the first director we had was uh, uh, we would say in the Bahamas, God bless his soul, Professor Nolly Butler, who just mm -hmm. passed away. And he came as our first director for the first year to two years. And then after him, we had a little, a little period in which Professor Ren Holness uh, wow. came down from Canada in the interim uh, mm -hmm. to serve as our director while we was looking for another director. And he was, uh, he was a, great, a great mentor to me because he was responsible for me getting my postgraduate training program in, in Canada. And, and then after his year, we got Professor Spencer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Spencer came along and uh, when it was time for his retirement in 2010, um, he said, Robin, I think that you're the one to, to follow me in this seat. And I said, listen, I don't know if I want to come to the university full time. Yeah. He said, yeah, I think, I think you're the one. <laughs> and so finally in 2010, I took this position. Okay. So. That's amazing. And very, very deserved as well. And we're happy to have you in this position. Yeah. Now, going back it's to the question from, from the Antiguan graduate, um, I know that he was talking, asking about whether you lectured as well as all mm -hmm. the other things that you did and where. I think you, be, you did some lecturing at the College of the Bahamas. Um, and I think you mentioned um, just recently that we, you also uh, lectured in surgery at the American University of the Caribbean in Montserrat. Um, but in terms of the West Indies, UWI, where did you lecture? Well, I, well, well once, once we started, once we joined UWI in 1997, 
Then I, I formally became an associate lecturer because I wasn't part-time. I was still a consultant surgeon mm -hmm. uh, at the Princess Margaret Hospital. Plus I was head of the Department of Surgery. So I remained as an associate lecturer. And uh, it was not until, uh, it was not until um, 2010 when I assumed the post as director, I became a senior lecturer and I became a full-time lecturer uh, on the University of the West Indies. Prior to that, I had a post as an associate lecturer at the American University of the Caribbean in Montserrat when they started. I have a very good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Whalen, at the, at the American University in Antigua. She is also a UWI graduate. And so she has invited me to be an, an associate lecturer down there. So I have, I have uh, visited them on uh, about two occasions, three occasions as an associate lecturer there. I also was very much a part of the University of the Bahamas before us, the College of the Bahamas, and was one of their lecturers in their pharmacy program. And um, so uh, uh, I, I've, been, I've been involved in doing some lectures here. All, all across the Caribbean. So you really uh, have like, this stamp. Yes. You were. You mentioned, yes. is it Dr. Walwyn in, in, in the Antigua? Yes, we Wal, Wal, yeah, Walwyn. She is in Antigua. Right. Is, is her father the, um, he also is a medical doctor, one of the first? Yes, doctors. that's right. That's the one. Yes, yes, that's one. Her father. I met him very old. He's a gentleman. He is, he is, uh, he is still alive. He is in his mm. mid or late 80s. Yes. Very yes. active. Yes, yes. yes. I, I, I met him. I, I actually was in Antigua earlier this year in October. And I had the good fortune of meeting him. He's one of the few of the class of 1930. That's right. He's he's one of our he's one of our historical graduates. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Wow. Okay, small world. Okay, now you mentioned a little earlier that you were um, you came back to the Bahamas as one as the first certified urologist in 1987, mm -hmm. and you really seem to have advanced urological surgery as a credible service in the Bahamas. And I know that you introduced several urological procedures which were never done in the Bahamas before, um, inclusive of minimal access and endoscopic procedures and other things that I can't pr pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have- Maybe you'd well, like you know, to elaborate a little bit on, on what things that you introduced. Well, well, you know something. The urology always was in the domain of the general surgeon. And we would like to think of it that they dabble in urology, so to speak. And so when I came home, the first thing uh, my professors taught me was that if you are going to establish this urology, and since you are the only one who is trained to do so, then in the beginning, you must do everything because you must take the position that no one else is as good as you are in order to do what you do. And then you can train someone to be with you. Mm -hmm. And you must make sure that you don't do anything that they do. And you must do everything the modern way. And so that's what I did. So when I, when I came home, you are know, young and full of vigor. And so I was, I made sure that every public patient that I saw that in my clinic, I saw everyone, every procedure I, I did, for urology, both public and private, I did them all. Mm -hmm. I was on call 24 seven. And so within a year to two years, they said, my goodness, this is what urology is. And so I, I basically became a household name. Mm -hmm. I had the people didn't even know what the word prostate was. And so I said, listen, I gotta make people aware of what urology and all this thing in the male health. And so I went on every radio station, I went on every TV station, I was writing in a newspaper. And so urology then became a household name. That's right. I wanted to establish that. Yes, and in 1996, you performed the first kidney transplant in the Bahamas. Tell us about that. Well, that was interesting because the first thing I tried to do when I came home, I said, I have all these patients who are on dialysis. I want to start a transplant. But you know, you can only do two things one time. And once I started to urology, that was taking up most of my time. But no one believed that we could do transplant in Nassau because they thought that this is something that is all in the modern world and so forth. 
And so all my attempts to get it started, they said we didn't have a budget, we didn't have any money or anything and so forth. And so I actually decided, well, I guess I'd have to do as my, my, uh, one of my mentors taught me. They said, he said, you're going to be too busy and your job is to train the next person to come up to do transplant because you're not going to have the time. Yeah. And one day in my public clinic, a young girl at the age of 18 walked in and she said, Dr. Roberts, I want to meet you. I have come because I heard you can do kidney transplants. I have a sister. She's on the family island. She can't live in Nassau. She has two children and she's on the machine. I have come. God has sent me to give her one of my kidneys so she can come back home. Oh. And uh, so I said, no, you're too young. You know, I said, no, I don't think you understand what you're doing. She says, no, 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 no. I prayed about this and he sent me and I'm not leaving here until you agree to do it. <laughs> That's incredible. And so I, I tell you, and so as things went along and within two months time, she had done all the testing and everything. We did a successful kidney transplant. And you know, that kidney lasted for 10 years. She had normal renal function. Excellent. And what happened though, I noticed in her 11th year, she started to, her kidney start function started to fail. And I said, something's wrong. And she said, um, she couldn't afford the medication. So she started skimping on it. Oh. She started taking it every two days or three days to stretch. And so she lost the kidney. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I couldn't convince her to come back to NASA. She said, no, I have 10 good years. And thank you very much. My kids are grown now and I'm not going back on that machine. And so it, it reinforced the need for us to do it. And more importantly, that it had to be a government driven uh, um, um, initiative because the average person can't afford it. Transplants mm -hmm. and the medications are very expensive. Yeah. And so That's that is why we want to have that as one of our first initiative mm -hmm. on our national health insurance package of benefits. Wonderful. That's amazing. Okay, I know you also introduced the multi-organ donor transplant with the University of Miami Health Systems, Miami yeah. Transplant In Institute, which allowed Bahamians to have liver and heart transplants in Miami. That, that, I, was, that was one of the most exciting things that I ever did. I was, could you imagine, one day, this was, on this I this home about, yeah, around about 10, 11 years, and I was walking through the private hospital, and I saw a friend of mine who... Uh, went back to school days and she was crying. And I said, why are you crying? She says, my husband is in the intensive care unit and, they, and he is dying. They said that um, he's, he's brain dead and they, this, and they want me to, uh, they want to pronounce him. But I really wish if I could do something more meaningful like donate. And I don't know how we can do that here. So I said, that's not a bad idea. I always wanted to have a relationship with the uh, University of Miami. So I called them and I said, would you like to have an organ, some, some organs from someone who's brain dead? And they said, fantastic. So we, we don't have any, um, we don't have a tissue act. And we had no means whereby we can just tell them to come in and harvest the organs. So I had to write within four hours I had to write and get permission from the permanent secretary in order for them to come to our institution. I had to write for them to get consent from the Minister of Health. I had to write the Immigration Department in order for them to uh, come into the country uh, to work. I had to get permission from the council in order for them to practice. And so I did all of that within about four hours and they came in the plane and we harvested the first set of organs and took them back. They said they like to leave them, but of course we couldn't use them right there and then. And uh, so that's how we started. That's amazing. Absolutely and, incredible. And what, what was interesting was the second one, because about six months later, this time it wasn't in a private hospital. It was in the it was in a public hospital. And this is a patient who I recognize as brain dead. And so I said, you know, let me see. It's a young man. He's twenty one years old. So the parents were quite prepared to give the organs. So I called to get permission. And the minister said, do you think that I'm going to allow them to come to the public hospital 
and to harvest organs and take the organs from a black person and take it to America? She says, no way, he says, now, but if you can get the patient across to the private hospital, they can do it from there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so we, we, uh, so that's what they did. The private hospital took them at no charge and uh, the team came over and harvested the game. Uh, uh, but what was so interesting about this one now was when we had harvested all the organs, they, we then, well, the patient was dead. So the mortician came up and they uh, took the, uh, the uh, body uh, to the mortuary. And when he was going to embalm, he realized that there were no organs. Mm. And so he called the police. <laughs> and he took, I can tell you, he called the police. And the police came and said, listen, you, you know that, you know, this is a dangerous offense. You're stealing organs and everything and stuff and so on. And uh, when he realized what was happening, so we contacted the coroner. And he thought this was a great opportunity. He was very, he was very partial towards us. So he said, I tell you what you, what's going to happen. I'm going to have a formal court hearing and I'm going to pass the policies how you can harvest the organs. So I had to get my lawyer and we, uh, we took a, we had a formal um, uh, court hearing in front of the coroner and we justified what we did. The coroner agreed and we established some policy guidelines on how we can harvest organs prior to a tissue act being done in the country. Excellent. Wow. Well, that story has a really happy ending. It really got you the policy that you needed. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. Um, I also note that you felt it important that doctors plan their careers to meet the surgical needs of your country. And you have been, um, I think it was, you've, you've organized plans for building the new surgical operating room. And you've also, um, pushed doctors from the Bahamas to go and get uh, um, qualified in areas like orthopedics, plastic surgery, vascular surgery, neurosurgery, and so on. So I think this is a, is, is a role, a very important role that you've played as well, so that your, your, your country's medical needs are met, not only now, but for the future. You know, there's some things that I've learned from, I remember I was very fortunate to have been uh, one of the physicians for our we consider the, the, the lead of our country, the, the nation builder, our prime minister, Sir Lyndon Penland. And when he was passing away, I had the privilege of talking with him. And I tell him, he said to me, I haven't done anything great. He said, I was just fortunate to be at a time when I had opportunities that I took. We learned so much in that era because we were late in the Caribbean in, in, compared to the rest of the Caribbean. It was not until 1967 that we had the first black government in our country. We became independent in 1973. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I can remember so well when, the, when our progressive liberal party became the leaders and the minister of health came to our, came to our school in 1967, 68. And he said, listen, we need you to go and build this country. We need lawyers, doctors, accountants, everything and so forth. Once you finish high school, we're going to give you, we're going to give you a scholarship to go off to university to come back. So that's how I got off to school. And you know, the people in my era returned. They came back to build a country. We have a record, and uh, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sincre, always roused me because I haven't formally published it. But we did a study of all the Bahamians who went to medical school, graduated from University of West Indies from the period of uh, 1948 until 2013. And we looked at all the Bahamian graduates from UWI. There were some four or 500 of us. We were able to trace them to see where they were, where did they go. And do you realize that during this period from, from 19, our first graduate, I think, was 1951 until 19, and nine, until 2013, that we could trace that we only lost 9% of our physicians. We had no brain drain. And of the 91% 
of them that stay, more than half of them spend their entire career employed in the government service. That's amazing. That shows the Caribbean pride. And the I am telling you. Building. And so what happened in our hospital then is that this, you know, when the when we saw that 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 cohort of individuals who were in that first wave from about ninety from sixty seven until about nineteen ninety to two thousand, all those graduates came back home, and they all wanted to go off to specialize, mm -hmm. and so it was at the same time that the university not only was starting, but more importantly, we got the government to to uh, support those individuals who wanted to go off to post and postgraduate training and to assist in funding them. And so that was even a great incentive to come back. And so what we found in our public institutions, our prime, our Princess Margaret Hospital has some has some 42 special and subspecialty services, of which practically 80% of them are Bahamians who went off and came back. They are, I'm telling you, so, so, they, so they, yeah. And I hope that, that um, some of the young, younger graduates and, and even students who might be tuning in are inspired by this to come back and serve their countries and to, to give back to their Caribbean. So you um, could imagine then that when I was a, a, an intern in 1980, an intern, we had in the Department of Surgery, we only had five consultants. We had four in general, three in general surgery and one in ENT and one in orthopedics. And that's 1980. Mm -hmm. And when I came back in 87, I became the head of the department in about 95. By 95, by the year 2000, so this is, and we saw our folks coming back. So by the year just over 2000, our consultant numbers have increased from five to now hitting 30. Oh. That's the surgery alone. So we yeah. now had from those three general surgeons, we now had, we now were having like seven general surgeons. We had four orthopedic surgeons. We had two all maxillary facial surgeons. We had neurosurgeons. We had plastic surgeons. And so those little three theaters that we had were not adequate. So we had to put in place some sort of structural, some sort of strategic plan and convince the government of the need for us to build a brand new operating theater complex, an intensive care unit. Ah. And so I was able to get our, to gather the troops together and we were able to write a strategic plan and the government said, yes, I think it's justified. We are prepared to spend the money. And so we got a brand new spiking state of the art um, critical care block with a whole new uh, intensive care for both adults and pediatrics and, and a pathology lab and, steril and steril um, uh, a st a sterilization unit mm -hmm. and our operating complex. So that's how that came about. Brilliant, brilliant. So Bahamians can rest assured and anybody visiting the Bahamas as well can be happy to know that your, your medical care is number one. And, and to give you an idea of our reports, uh, about two years ago, we had a we had a conference here whereby we're looking at minimal invasive uh, doing laparoscopic surgery and through the Caribbean College of Surgeons of which uh, most of our, our surgeons are, we were able to beam that surgery live to all the other members in the Caribbean Wow! as it was being performed. Excellent, excellent. So you sharing your knowledge as well. Absolutely. Wow. We have a, a graduate from the Mona campus who has been listening, and you mentioned that your publications, I know that you have well over 30 publications covering your area of medical specialty and general health care. Um, and he is now saying that he's going to be looking up some of your publications because he's finding this. <laughs> <so interesting. laughs> um, yep. you, you also had several awards in your lifetime, starting with high school, your chemistry prizes in 1968. And then, of course, you received the Canadian Commonwealth Scholarship, and you um, and you performed excellently there, um, being commended for your academic excellence from 1972 to 1974. All three years, you got awards, and you got the University Medal for Biochemistry. 
And then at Mona, you receive your MBBS with first class honors. And you also receive the Henderson Medal for Exper Experimental Psychological Science at UWI, the Medical for Physiology, and the Noel Hayes Prize for Anatomy at UWI. And in 1979, you received the Dr. Frank Granham Memorial Prize for Social and Preventative Medicine. So I know you're very modest and wouldn't have, have said that yourself, so I said it for you. <laughs> I also want to let our audience know that you were honored with the 2004 Bahamian Legend Award and at the 40th anniversary celebrations of independence of the Bahamas in 2014, you are honored as one of the nation's 40 outstanding fathers. So I would just like to commend you on behalf of the alumni population and to say how proud we are of you, of, of all of your various uh, um, awards. And of course, in 2018, you received the Queen's Honor of the Order of the British Empire. So you are OBE. Um, now, in terms of presentations and abstracts, you have given over 121 in your career, maybe more. But what I found interesting was it was really, again, all over the Caribbean and the world, countries including Trinidad, Aruba, Guyana, Jamaica, Martinique, Canada, the USA, and of course, your home country of, of the Bahamas. Um, I have a comment coming in from uh, the Open Campus Dominica asking how you fit all of this into your schedule and any tips for balancing it all? Well, you know what? The, the other thing that happened in my life, uh, when I was, uh, after I finished internship, I got married and that stabilized me. Okay. And I had the good, I have the good fortune of my wife, Carolyn, uh, who is a clinical psychologist. So I guess she understands all my nuances and she tolerates me and keeps me all straight. Uh, so really, I would not have been able to do a lot of what I've done um, were it not for her. When I get home, I could relax, and it's good to great to get home from that perspective. You know, that really makes a difference. Uh, but more importantly, though, I, I, I think that I really want to give credit to being a student of the University of West Indies because it really imbued in me what it is to be a Caribbean national. Because I never knew what it was to be a Caribbean national. And uh, you know, the Bahamas, there are quite a number of folks in the Bahamas don't like to associate with the Caribbean. They don't see themselves as, as West Indian. We're too close to America. But in every way, we are very much a, a lifestyle, uh, education, everything. We as we as Caribbean as you can get. And um, it is it is important and uh, when you look back, you have to ask, what is my purpose in life? Why am I here? You know, and, and the, the good thing about medicine is that if you apply yourself, and I do believe that, um, that you don't have to worry whether the patients will come. They will come. And you don't have, you will make money. Okay? I, I always say, you don't, have, you don't have to charge high prices. The patients will come and they will be happy to pay you, if not in, in cash in kind. And it's amazing how far that in kind can go. You know, uh, at one of the things, my wife, she says, you know, I can't remember ever going to buy fish because my patients always bring me fish. When it's the lobster season, they bring me lobster. You know, when I want to have something done in my house, my patients will come. I have someone who's a carpenter or whatever and so forth. And they will say, listen, um, you know, doc, I, I can do that for you. And so, you know, that, that helps. And it makes a big difference. And so, uh, but to put it all in perspective, if you really wanted to, I was giving a talk the other day. And I said, if I look at where I was at the time when I left high school, to when I came back after seven, after 15 years of post high school, if I were in America, I would have a bill, I would have a debt of some $300,000 to pay back. When I came home after 15 years, I didn't have a dime, but I didn't owe a dime. So I was already $300,000 ahead. And all of that was because of what I would consider the will of the Bahamian people. 
They went through metal and me getting scholarships, going to high school, going off to university. When I went to medical school, my tuition was $100 a year. So, you know, the government paid for me to be there. So we have to have this sense, this, this commitment to give back. And that's what enriches your life. Yes, I agree. And, and the fact that, you know, the, our governments generally feel that uh, education is an investment. An it investment is. In its it is. And our, our human resource, our graduates really, truly are, are our most valuable products um, to the region. And I, I hope a lot of people find this very, very inspiring. Another thing you mentioned about the, um, the, the influence of UWI was having all of these Caribbean teachers because in Canada, of course, obviously you had excellent professors, but having excellent professors who were Caribbean people, Caribbean born. Absolutely, and Caribbean absolutely, to the absolutely, experience. absolutely. They, you know, and, 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 they, and, and it, is, it is the care that they give and the concern that they give. And, you know, and one of the treasured moments that we have is that you were taught how to practice medicine with those clinical skills as if you had no technology and you could give good quality care. And that made a big difference. Absolutely. And in fact, with, you know, the world is changing so rapidly and yes, we rely on technology, but the world is also showing us that with climate change and other impacts, sometimes we won't have technology to rely on. So we need to get back to those basic clinical diagnostic skills that I think really will become very valuable in the future. Very when, really when, our, you know, when hurricanes or floods or whatever knock out our technology, our doctors and other scientists will have to go back to the basics and, and do what you, we taught them to do. <laughs> well, you know, but our, our greatest challenge still lies ahead. And the greatest challenge, yes, in the same way in which the UWI has the great challenge of one time ago, uh, it was 100% funded by the governments and now it finds itself in 50% where it has to, or less uh, being funded by the governments, that there have been some major paradigm shifts in medical education. And uh, so it is whether we, in that's our challenge today now, in the in the medical faculty can we can we make the shift that we supposed to make and 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 the way to summarize that is that today when you finish undergraduate medical education if you are in north america or you in europe you are automatically uh enrolled in postgraduate education and so you are not allowed to go an independent private practice until after you have a postgraduate specialty. And so the undergraduate education today has become an entrance exam, not an exit exam. And so when you finish your MBBS, we should automatically be going into postgrad programs. And even if that primary postgrad program was in family medicine or community medicine, and uh, so that is the big transfer that we have to make. How do we do that? Because you imagine now, if we in Tohu now are looking at some 400 to 500 students graduating in the medical faculty year, that the year they graduate at the same time, we are opening up some four to 500 postgraduate posts for them, okay? Uh, that's where we should be going in medical education. That is the challenge. How do we do it? How do we find the funding to do that? Indeed, but I, I, I do believe that you should be the champion for this and <laughs> everybody else on board. <laughs> Make it happen. I think you have a way. Okay, now I also know you've published. You've published three books, and the latest published in 2015 is called Sparking the Debate, the Introduction of National Health Insurance in the Bahamas which I know you feel is a very important topic. So tell us a little bit about this. Well, the other, that, that other major shift that has happened in medicine today has been the fact that the most exciting thing that has happened during the, during the 20th century is that man's lifespan has doubled from about 45 to we are now living into the 80s easily. But we paid a price for that. We have new technology, we have new medicines, we have better uh, healthcare providers. Uh, you, 
they have to be paid. We have consumerism in medicine. So medicine now has become extremely expensive. It's not cheap. And so governments who find themselves and have to provide care, all of a sudden, their budgets are exhausted. They can't fund this new care that they originally had on the old British days. And so national health insurance is all about funding, providing the monies required for healthcare delivery today. And uh, so we realize with the new technology in our institutions that you, you know, that has now become the standard of care. But a CAT scan costs two and three million dollars, an MRI at that level, and to keep them and how many we need. And so when we look at the doctors returning and we look at them wanting to practice the standard of care, then we are knocking on the doors of the government and saying, listen, the private people there, yeah, they can have it in private insurance, but in most other countries, that's not even, that's about 30% of our people at most. 60, 70% of the population depend on the government public service. Right. Where are they going to get the money from? Right. So that is where national health insurance come in. That is where the whole issue of universal health care coverage come in. And so uh, as I've gotten older and realized the importance of that, and as you get older, you realize that you can't afford health insurance. And as you get older, you need more care and it's more expensive. And so uh, I have been uh, very fortunate to have been appointed the chairman of the National Health Insurance Authority. And with our board, we have been given that responsibility of designing and implementing a national health insurance program. And so we are on, we are on the path for universal health care. We now have started the first phase, the primary health program two years ago. We have some 67,000 people who are enrolled in our primary health insurance program, and we intend to extend that to the whole population. And we're also trying to implement our second level, what we call secondary and tertiary health care to be a part of it. So this is a very exciting time for me. It has a feel as if I'm, as I'm leaving academia, I'm going into the next phase. <laughs> Absolutely, and a very important phase. Health insurance is, is really key. Absolutely. If you don't help your health, you can't do anything Absolutely. else. So. And, and it also shows us in today's uh, market where um, physicians, it's an exciting time for the new uh, young doctor who comes in. You don't have to look at clinical medicine. There's so many avenues now in terms of non-clinical medicine, looking at, we need physician managers, we need physician executives, we need physicians in informatics, we need physicians uh, you know, in, in, in hospital, in, uh, in, in the financial world. And so there are so many new opportunities for the young graduates come out, coming out today. I'm jealous, you know, <laughs> and especially with the computer world today. You know, it's, it's amazing. This is an exciting time in medical education. Very exciting. I know um, I'm leading, going to segue into your, your, your uh, interest in, in cancer, prostate cancer in particular, but just to mention that you've also done some television productions. In 1993, you did one, Here's to Your Health, Bahamas. And in 1996, you did one on prostate cancer in the Bahamas as well. And really, as you mentioned before, you essentially single-handedly carried the message throughout the Bahamas for males to take responsibility for their health, particularly in regards to reproductive health. Yeah. And you've made the term prostate gland and prostate cancer a household name. Everybody can say it and there's no stigma. So tell us a little bit about this because you mentioned taking it, you know, taking it to the airwaves, to TV, radio, and, and, and writing about it. Well, tell us a little bit about more well, about Well, the it. first thing that struck me within a year of being home, I realized that I was seeing these men coming with prostate cancers, the most common cancer in the men, and 80% of them were presenting with advanced cancer for the first time. They'd be dead. Half of them would have died within two years. And, and I realized that, my goodness, we can't be having this advanced disease. We have to try and pick this up early so we can treat it and they can live a full life. And so that is how I started to say, how do we pick this up early? And that is where the whole issue of screening came about. Mm -hmm. And so I had to get the message out that, man, you got to come to the doctor early. You have to get your checkup. This is what the cancer is about. This is what's happening to the man. And um, so and then it also happened that in the late 90s, the screening uh, blood test came out, this prostate 
the PSA blood test. So we had to go out and have awareness programs so the men to realize they should have this blood test done. And then the fear of men having a rectal exam, you know, in the Caribbean, we're very homophobic now. So, so we, so once you tell a man that he has to have a rectal exam, you know, that's a no, no. And uh, so um, this was the message I tried to get out. And then we realized at the end of the day, the other part of the coin was that it was not only prostate cancer, but men were dying of high blood pressure and, and diabetes and, and heart attacks and all these non-communicable diseases that are so prevalent in our community and which which uh, almost looking at the premature death rates of being almost 50% of our young men dying. And uh, so the, we, we realized that this whole prostate thing was linked into a man's sexuality, you see? So he realized he needed this good prostate in order to function as a man. And so this became the toe, the, in, uh, the wedge into the door. So I can say, listen, uh, come to the clinic and get your prostate checked to make sure you keep your manhood. And at the same time, we will check your blood pressure and your diabetes and all that stuff and so on. Wow. So, so uh, urology then became the prime stay of, of uh, introducing men into changing their, their, their habits to be better positive health seeking behavior and to better their health. Yes. And so good. that's how that's how from a urologist I came into primary health care. Wow. And I looked at our national health uh, our overall health care. And that's how the hairs to your health Bahamas came about. Okay. Okay. I know you've you've done a lot in medical education, you've done a lot yes. in cancer, but also family planning. Because yes. you're the longest standing board member of the Bahamas family planning. Um and you were instrumental in the government undertaking a nationally, national family planning policy. And you also secured $2 million through the American Development Bank for a family planning center as a training, education, and resource center. So you're, you're, you've really spread far and wide. <laughs> well, well, what happened again for my urology coming from Canada, whereby well, every week we have doing, you're literally doing two and three vasectomies a day. And I come home and uh, two years pass and I didn't get to do one vasectomy. The men wouldn't come forward. Mm -hmm. And when I go out, they look at me and they say, are you crazy? We don't do that. And uh, so I joined family planning to see how I can get the men interested in family planning. And I remember so well when I was in Barbados, how they had such an aggressive and effective family medicine, family planning program. And how when they tried to get a vasectomy program going, that it took them about a year plus to get the first man to come forward. And this is a guy who came with 16 children. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, so I know we had a lot of work to do. So that's how my interest got into family planning. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad. I'm, I hope you you tempered his, his, his whatever. So 16 is the final number for him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to mention, too, that you've served on many important boards and com committees. Um, the two uh, most recent, uh, from 20, in 2015, you were uh, co-vice chair of the National Task Force on Gender-Based Violence, mm -hmm. and in 2017, chairman of the board of the National Health Insurance Authority. Um, you also are very service-oriented and have given service in many ways as uh, vice president and president of the Medical Association of the Bahamas. Mm -hmm of president of the Bahamas Planned Parenthood Association. Um, you are still president of the Physician Alliance Management Limited and associate editor of the West Indian Medical Journal at the UWI Faculty of Medicine. Um, you've just done so many things. A question now has come in from a graduate of St. Augustine in Trinidad. As a UE Pelican, we are now officially in the top 4% of universities in the world, a fact about, where our, about which we're all very proud but he wants to know, as you travel around the world, how do you find UE's reputation? Let me tell you that when you mention the word University of the West Indies, your heart will swell because people's knowledge of the University of the West Indies, what they do know is that it's a center of excellence. And the reason why they hold it in such regard 
because whenever they come in contact with a doctor who is a graduate of the University of the West Indies, they are impressed by their medical expertise. Uh, we have, we have uh, graduates of the University of the West Indies, particularly in medicine, that are throughout the world. And in all the areas and all the faculties they're in, they have been outstanding not only in clinical performance, but in research. And uh, so the name of the University of the West Indies, our graduates can be proud, very proud. I'm of very happy to hear that as Director of Alumni Relations. I know our graduates. Oh, yeah. You, 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 can, you, can, you can feel proud. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, in the world over, it's really amazing how our graduates have risen to, to top positions in, in most mm -hmm. hospitals around the world. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, we're, we're beginning to wind down now and I wanted to ask you. I, I just want to give you an example. I must plug in something. One of my heroes in medicine that you have practicing, mm -hmm. uh, still in Barbados, uh, Professor Ren Holness. Okay? Ah, yes, yes, And yes. to give you an idea, um, when I was a resident, uh, he was head of the Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, he... Uh, he became the president of the Canadian Neurosurgical uh, Association. He was the chief examiner for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, the, or any accolade that you can name in Canada, he has achieved. Okay, so when you see him still practicing, he came back home in order to continue mm -hmm. to give service. He has been responsible for so many of my graduates here making sure they got, uh, they were trained in Canada. And the same thing applies in Jamaica and Barbados and so forth. And so when you have um, positions like him, whose reputation is internationally acclaimed, right? That's the UWI graduate mm -hmm. that we can emulate. Or we should be trying to emulate because Absolutely. they have established the reputation for us and we have to follow that. Yes, your true, true words as, as spoken by you. And um, kudos really to, to Dr. Ren Holness. He is, he is just like you, amazing. <laughs> so as we close, I wanted to just, you mentioned that your wife, um, Carolyn Roberts, is a native, well, I know she's a native of Andros and you're, you've been married for 36 years or more. I'm not sure. Well, it, uh, well we, you know, uh, 38. 38, right. And you have two children, and you've also been blessed with grandchildren. I got, I've got three grands. Mm -hmm. This one is eight, and I'll tell you, it's true. It's always better the second time around. <laughs> I, that's the folks would say, if I knew it was going to be that great, I would bypass the children and go straight to the grand. That's right. That's right. I think it's because what you can give grandchildren back, though, when, <laughs> when you had enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, as we close, I wish to mention that in... 2013, the government of the Bahamas appointed you as the co-vice chair of the National Task Force for Gender-Based Violence in the Bahamas, as I said before, and that the 200-page report was presented to the cabinet in 2015, and that the World Health Organization, UN Women, lauded the plan as a prototype for developing countries. So I think that is something, an accomplishment of which you can be very proud as well. Thank you. You know, the, 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 uh, I, I must plug in and say that that's all a part of our male reproductive health. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I saw myself as not just looking at the man from a reproductive point of view, but we have to look at the whole man mm -hmm. and how he relates to his partners, his position in the community. And a lot of uh, our, our poor seeking health habits are related to this whole machoism mm -hmm. that we have in the Caribbean. And uh, so we have to work very hard at that. And this, uh, a lot of it is rooted in this gender-based violence. And if we are to eradicate this, and it's a terrible plague on our society, honestly, then we need to look at ourselves as men and we need to appreciate uh, that this masculinity that we have in many ways prevents us from being human and forming better relationships. And uh, so, uh, again, another challenge that we have in our societies. Mm -hmm. But a challenge you are helping overcome. You seem to yeah, be you have to do a little bit, so many. Little bit, 
I li every little bit that you can. Absolutely, absolutely. I also want to mention that in 2017, you were honored by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of, the, of Glasgow, Scotland, and that this prestigious international medical organization bestowed on you an honorary fellowship in 2018 for your contribution to advancing medical education in the Caribbean. And you have also been designated formally as the international advisor to the Royal College in the Caribbean. So again, kudos and congratulations. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Based on our conversation that we've just had, this interview, I know why it happened. <laughs> well, UWI Pelicans, as we close, I hope you've enjoyed today's Pelican Talk with our distinguished guest, Dr. Robin Roberts, OBE. I would like to thank Howard Shand, our digital media and database manager, who facilitates this whole interview. I am Celia Davidson Francis, Director of Alumni Relations for UWI, and I invite you to join us on our next Pelican Talk when we will once again engage our alumni across the Caribbean and the world in novel and enriching exchanges. So thanks for tuning in and until next time, continue please to show your Pelican pride. And again, Dr. Roberts, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it was a, it was a treat. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>